It's time for our last panel of the day. Please take your seats. It's two o'clock and we will commence our last panel of the day. Please be seated. Oh, you don't have to run. It's healthy. Welcome again. Uh, we will now talk about our next issue, which is how can the international community work together to support the Afghan people? We will have uh, three panelists with us to discuss, to discuss this issue. We have Ulrika Modea, Assistant Secretary General and Director of Bureau of External Relations and Advocacy at the UNDP. We will have here in Stockholm, Karin Jemtin, Director General for the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA. And we have with us as well, uh, Terje Vatterdal, Country Director, Norwegian Afghanistan Committee. Welcome to you um, online from Kabul. And Ulrika will join us very shortly. Um, she is soon with us online again uh, as well. And in the meantime, uh, we will start with hearing from you, Karin, uh, a short introduction address. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, to start off with, thank you for giving me this opportunity. But most of all, thank you for a very interesting day. I had the opportunity actually of listening in in the morning. It made, it heightened my knowledge, but it also made me more confused. It's an extremely difficult situation in the country, to say the least. And there were many, um, some questions marks being straightened out to, to um, more, more clear answers, but some questions mark, marks remain. And I suppose that we will continue to discuss that now and talk about that now. At CEDA, we are responsible for uh, delivering the, or, uh, yeah, they are delivering on the des decisions by the government around uh, the long-term uh, support to Afghanistan or in Afghanistan rather, uh, and also the humanitarian aid. And what I suppose that we will discuss both here uh, during the, this 45 minutes. Basic social services is of course at the core of all donor priorities. But the Swedish government has, as we heard from the minister this morning, also articulated that the humanitarian approach, approach is not sufficient. Development aid should continue to the extent possible. Long-term development cooperation. But, and that has also been expressed by many, it is a challenge to continue to carry out relevant and efficient aid in Afghanistan. For many, actually quite practical reasons, but also for many political and um, political reasons, let's put it that way. At CEDA, we have, together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, developed a set of preconditions for our development work. In summary, we echo what many have said earlier today. It means that the development aid should benefit the Afghan people. It should benefit the Afghan people and not the regime. No funds will be channeled through the regime and no contributions should strengthen the regime. But we are to work with long-term development aid and that we will certainly find ways. We will continue to apply a human rights-based approach and we will never ever accept institutionalized discrimination of any kind being it gender-based discrimination, ethnic discrimination, or any, any other kind of institutionalized discrimination. One of our main partners is, of course, the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan. We've been long-term, uh, the, the committee has for been in, for many years in the country, and we are long-term partners. We are confident that the committee will continue and can stay and deliver to the Afghan people. They have done that, or you have done that over 40 years and will be able to find ways. But I will just end this introduction by, by underscoring that we need all of us to have a systematic approach 
and never rely on only one partner. I'm saying this because the Swedish committee can never alone solve the situation or deliver to all of the people in Afghanistan. There needs to be other partners. The international community, preferably with the UN lead, should quickly, rather yesterday, as we spoke about on the coffee break, find solutions to fund essential programs in many areas, health, education, rural development, and others. But now, of course, outside of the Afghan budget and disconnected from the new regime. Um, there are examples of other such funds, for example, in Yemen. One other area that is important for us and will continue to be important for us and that I would like to underscore from the beginning here is that we will need to continue to support the broad civil society inside the country, but maybe also at times outside of the country. We are putting increased uh, focus on the security of our partners as we understand the challenges both maybe mainly inside the country, but also somewhat outside of the country. So we will stay, we will continue to support our partners, but there are some certain red lines, right. and they are clear. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Uh, Terje, Terje Vatterdal from joining us from Kabul. Would you like to continue, please? Are you, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, I'm uh, unmuted and uh, ready from Kabul. Perfect. Um, we are facing um, a crisis in Afghanistan and this crisis is resulting, of course, from conflict and war and a complete lack of good governance, both from the former government um, and from the new government who has very little or no experience in governing a complex modern society. Um, in the world that is very different from the world in the early 2000s when they were last in power. But the crisis is exacerbated by the actions of the US, the World Bank and Western allies of the former government. The world seems to do all it can to make the new government fail without having any real alternative in place. In the past, the world watched on as a kleptocracy of unprecedented proportions established itself in Kabul and throughout the country. And now come with demands from the new governments that the former governments would also have had great difficulties in fulfilling. The extreme measures taken by the international community contributes to the crisis in Afghanistan and the general public, the children, youth, women and men in communities across the country have become hostage between an extreme medieval and ultra conservative theocracy on one side and a Western world who seem to be so it was pride seems to be wounded after a crushing defeat on the other. And I meet young people, old people, every single day who have lost hope. They're frustrated with the increasing hardship of everyday life, no cash because banks are empty, little food, no jobs, and few prospects of any change happening soon. And many are facing the harsh Afghan winter without heat or food or jobs. But they're also frustrated that the solidarity of the world seemed to have left Afghanistan with the military evacuation flights that took off over their heads during the dramatic days in August, with promise of help to come, but lacking an ability to deliver on the ground. The systems in education, health, that we have painstakingly built over many, many years when huge investments, time and effort are collapsing. Unless we take action soon, we do face an unprecedented humanitarian disaster and we will not be able to wash our hands in innocence. The UN is on the ground. The Swedish Committee for Afghanistan and the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee are on the ground 
but we're currently facing more barriers from international power holders than support. In meeting with senior government officials, Ministry of Education, Health and Agriculture, they desperately plead for support and have so far been quite compromising in dealing with most of us. But they are also proud people and they feel that they won the war, but they are beginning to realize that they are losing the peace. So the patience with us is wearing thin. Um, I do not want to, for the international community to do anything to legitimize the government. Nobody wants this theocracy. But I see few alternatives to working with the new government, especially the more technical ministries of education, health, agriculture, irrigation and livestock, and rural rehabilitation and development. But I fear that after going into Afghanistan with great military might, but without a proper plan, withdrawing from Afghanistan without a proper plan, that the international community again has no proper plan on how to prevent a human humanitarian catastrophe and the loss of many, many more lives in this tired and war-torn country. And we're lacking effective systems on the ground to implement any of the plans that may be discussed. But I hope I'm wrong. Um, so this is not a plea for support for the Afghan government, but it is a plea for support for the Afghan people. And I feel that they are at loss when we stick to principles that we have broken again and again over the past years. So this is my plea to, uh, to all the power holders that are represented in Stockholm, that uh, in this process where we stick to principles, yes, but please do not forget the Afghan people. And we need to be able to provide effective support for the children, the youth, the women and men that are around us every day. So this is my voice from Kabul. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be hearing more from, from Kabul. But first, welcome Ulrika. Welcome to, to the conference. And if you would like to give us your introductory speech, please. Thank you so much. And uh, I've been accompanying, even though um, traveling, uh, uh, caught in traffic. Uh, I'm in London right now. Uh, very interesting to listen to both Karin and to Terry, of course. And, I hope to be able to listen in even to the discussions that have been held throughout the day as well. Um, so you see, uh, it looks like I'm called Jimmy Tang, but this is my colleague. I had to borrow a computer to, to see to that I could come and be with you in this important conversation. And, and tell you, I mean, I, I have recently also met uh, with Jan Egeland in Oslo. And of course, uh, throughout these uh, past months, we've had a number of discussions uh, with INGO partners, also including the Swedish Afghan Committee. And we have all agreed on the need to look at this on a long-term basis. And perhaps, Jörl and, and colleagues in Saki, if I can start by saying, if we look at the world, uh, what we feared would be the development has now become the reality. Uh, of the day, and that is that we don't only see uh, a number of increasingly protracted crises, but we also see a number of increasing crises that are increasingly protracted. So this is yes about Afghanistan, but it's not only about uh, Afghanistan, it's about the region and it's about the international development we see. And it's about the need to turn uh, the number of seminars and reports we've had throughout the past years with the so-called nexus approach uh, into practice. Um, if we can't show as an international community how to give support to those most in need, we know that the numbers of people living in extreme poverty in the conflict-ridden protective crisis areas will increase. Uh, this is what we have said again and again, and now we need to prove. And I was very also interested to hear, Terry, your very kind of straightforward call for a different way of working. And this is what we are discussing as the UN also together with INDOs and the people on the ground. Um, because what we have been doing, of course, 
not knowing uh, when it would happen, but that we would see most likely the development that we have seen in Afghanistan is also to turn back to the way uh, we worked 20 years ago, and that is at the provincial level, the way SOC and others have been working um, also uh, throughout these 20 years, where we've seen a lot of uh, also improvements to see to that we could find a way to construct some kind of directly implementing uh, modality. Uh, I think that this is not uh, Terje and Karin and those of you who are listening long term solution, but it can be something in between uh, focus on humanitarian um, aid uh, towards what could perhaps be a better solution in uh, this protracted crisis that we will most likely see where we need as an international community to find a way of working that can then sustain the development gains, the investments being made by the international community, but not least, I would say, of course, uh, by the Afghan people. I think it's incredibly important, and I'm sure this has been said again and again throughout the day, that we have not lost 20 years of development. The development is enshrined in the people who have been part of this in Afghanistan. And while the international community is very keen, of course, and we have a sanctioned regime to see to that, we can hold uh, also uh, the new... Uh, government uh, accountable uh, with regards to the norms and standards that are also uh, held by the UN. Uh, we, of course, also need to understand that also it's at the local level where we need to support people uh, to have the agency also to hold their decision makers to account, as is the case in any other country. This is the long term sustainable way of supporting uh, Afghanistan. And this is the way also that we've seen the development. I mean, even in, in Taliban-controlled areas, and, and Tariq can also testify to this, and so colleagues as well. I mean, of course, uh, people have, with increased education, with increased capacities, uh, been able to also negotiate also uh, increasing uh, rights at the local level, that is, the girls that needs to go back to school. Now, what we have done then is uh, from day one to stress the importance, as we knew that this was going to be also very complicated politically, but also a protracted crisis that we would have to deal with in a different way, is to agree also with our humanitarian colleagues and Martin Griffiths leading OCHA in New York uh, has from day one also been very uh, keen to see too that we could see how to uphold development gains, but also to work in this nexus in practice mode, that is how we could support development efforts, not only to save lives, but actually also to save livelihoods. And what has concerned me throughout also these months is that uh, many politicians have not perhaps shown the leadership that I would have wished for, given the many evidences that we have throughout the past decade uh, of work in these crisis settings. Uh, there has been uh, too much of kind of looking for the easy answers in one of the most complicated situations that we have ahead of us. I can see the time is running, uh, Jarl. But, but just to say that it's not that difficult to explain to anyone uh, that it's better to support the farmer so that he or she could actually uh, harvest the winter crop uh, in Afghanistan and sell it on the market to fix that bridge and see to that we can support livelihoods. It's not difficult to explain that we need to support the over 60,000 female-led micro and small enterprises at the local level to sustain the local economy instead of having these people, men and women, standing in a food line to receive uh, traditional humanitarian uh, ODA. We need to work differently and uh, we need to start to design that now because winter is coming, people are dying, and this is going to be something that we have ahead of us development funds are frozen, they need to be repurposed, we cannot use the scarce humanitarian funds, they are being taken from elsewhere, this is a zero sum game, uh, other hidden crises are paying the cost also for this. So we need to look, as I said in the beginning, at this also with the view of what's happening in the world uh, across the board, and happy to come back. Uh, thank you. Right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we've, we heard from Taria, we, we all know winter is coming, uh, the situation is extremely dire. We need to get uh, humanitarian aid in there. People are dying, people are hungry, there is no money, there is not much of anything. Um, but also, I hear from all of you, and, and I think it's important that we discuss the long-term issues. Uh, do it differently, work differently, uh, learn from past experiences, but how? 
how, how do we build this long-term uh, development aid if we are working in a country which gov who, where the government is not even recognized by the international community? Khan, would you? It's of course an immense challenge, but it's been done before and it will unfortunately be, probably be done in another country elsewhere in the future. <coughs> so let's look at the learn from the history. <coughs> I was going to take the same example as the minister took this morning on Sudan, where a lot of support has been going over many, many years to small civil society Sudanese structures, um, big international non-governmental organizations and others to work with education, basic health, uh, uh, freedom of speech, many, many areas that are important for people also living under uh, different kinds of, of dictatorships or whatever label one should use. So there are methods that can be used, but uh, we will not, my guess is that we will, or my guess, we, we will be in a situation where it will not be possible for us to channel money directly to the regime in, in Kabul or, or to the country as such. This means that international non-governmental organizations, the Afghan civil society, as well as mainly probably the United Nations will be the main channels for us because we have to work with sustaining what has been the wins over the, these last 20 years. Uh, and maybe also improve, in some instances, health, health sectors, and et cetera. It can be done and we can learn from other countries. That is more or less my point. Right. Mm. Uh, Ulrika, would you like to add something to that? Yes, I mean, so, I mean the UN agencies have been uh, staying and delivering, as uh, we've said, uh, uh, mainly with humanitarian funds. Uh, what we are discussing now with governments uh, across the board in donor countries is the need to repurpose the development funds into what has nowadays been called a humanitarian plus approach. That is also the nexus approach, how we can support and save lives, but also livelihoods. As I said in the beginning, I think this is uh, somewhat kind of a uh, still not as short sighted as, as only looking for humanitarian support. Uh, it is upholding uh, development gains, it's upholding the local economies. Um, and uh, we have also created for that purpose a multi part trust fund uh, that could be funded uh, for this purpose to uphold local economy. Uh, I think also, as I said in the beginning, I mean, international NGOs and Terry, I think you would agree, I mean, also need the UN uh, to stay uh, so that we can also make sure that we can set up some kind of public function support uh, as we have been doing in other uh, crisis settings. I mean, in, in Yemen, UNDP is, is running on behalf of the World Bank. This is also interesting, perhaps a discussion for a different seminar, how the international uh, ODA structure looks like, because there are many different layers of actors here. But the World Bank, as we know, has withdrawn. It's the UN that stays. And we need to find a way then to uphold some of, of the local uh, functions, uh, as, as Terry alluded to. And I think everyone agrees, you know, uh, basic health, basic uh, also uh, uh, education and so on. Uh, we have also actually early on, and I think uh, may, some of you have seen that, uh, have had funds released also from the Global Fund, uh, which I think was uh, uh, a bit surprising uh, because others had not moved at the time. And I think uh, this was a brave step of them to see to that also together with SOC, we could support also some of the local health clinics. But I mean, we are not talking about small projects here and there. Uh, we're talking about the risk of the entire country falling into extreme poverty, 97% as we are calculating, as we had very recent data from our socioeconomic analysis, are going to be in a situation of extreme poverty. And uh, also, I think, uh, uh, we saw uh, the updates also from the Norwegian Refugee Council and, and Egeland visiting now Iran. I mean, people start to move. The first weeks, uh, we did not see that movement. On the contrary, we saw people moving back to Afghanistan. But of course, this will also uh, result in, in forced displacement and, and a refugee crisis uh, coming out of Afghanistan. And the neighboring countries are, of course, very concerned with regard to that. So I can't see why the international community would be willing only to support the neighboring countries and not the people in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. given the situation that we have. Right. 
and and what we are asking for is not projects here and there. It's it's a system that can actually sustain uh, livelihoods, but also uh, the basic services. And then we, I guess, need to discuss a more long term solution for this. Right. Uh, I'd like to to come back to you a little bit later. Uh, the trust fund that you mentioned. First of all, Taria, um, how do you see see the long term development? Uh, working in new ways, new orders. What do you foresee? I think most of us have been working both in government and in opposition controlled areas. And now, of course, the opposition is the government. Uh, and I think Ulrike was saying, uh, she was talking about the triple nexus, and, and that's the method that we need to use. We need to make sure that when we do infrastructure project, that this is done through community contracting, that we do not subcontract to rich and well-connected businessmen, but that people in the community benefit directly, food support money, at the same time as they are constructing agro-based infrastructure that will help improve yields in the years to come. Um, we need to work with the schools that are already there in addition to the community-based education uh, systems. But um, we work currently with schools with more than 260,000 students. Uh, most of them are in, in government schools, but they are more or less functioning as, uh, as community schools now because the teachers don't get salaries. So, as Ulrike was saying, it, it, it really, this is not like one little project here and there, but we need to have a large scale effort. And there are systems in place in the communities, with the community development councils, with the cluster councils that we can work with. Uh, they are still in place. Uh, the old shudas, the elders in the villages, um, we need to work with them to make sure that the systems that we build, that it will be sustained over time. Um, and I, I still think that we can make it, but time is really running out. Mm -hmm. And we need to both do development long term at the same time as providing short term for people because they have a need for bread tomorrow. But we also need to enable them to grow their crops when spring comes. So we, we just managed to, uh, through the support of the UN, through FAO, uh, provide uh, seeds for farmers so that they can put them in the ground before the winter comes so that when spring comes, the wheat will come soon after. So th these are systems are there, but they are about to collapse and we need to, there is urgency. Right. We don't have time to wait. No, we, we don't have time to wait. Um, I know there's a lot of uncertainties and we don't know much about the pal Taliban policies uh, that, that they, they don't give us much, but do we do know anything about their priorities when it comes to development cooperation and will they let the international community in? Um, as they, they know that the international community, a large part of the international community, hold completely different um, policies and practice and principles than the Taliban regime. I mean, how do we make this cooperation? Maybe you would like to start on this one, Ulrike. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, we need to uh, uh, to have discussions and this is happening. And as Thayya said, I mean, it has been happening also throughout the past 20 years. I think sometimes uh, in the more superficial debate about <laughs> Afghanistan and, and we need to remind ourselves that uh, uh, the Taliban have controlled areas and, and uh, organizations like the Swedish Afghan Committee and the Norwegian Refugee Council, they have been uh, also negotiating space. And people, as I said, themselves, I mean, Terry alluded to the strong civil society, the deeply rooted civil society that is also there uh, and, and really <laughs> resilient, but that will not be resilient if uh, they both lose uh, you know the, the opportunity for their own livelihoods and 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 the belief in in the future uh, so we we have those discussions uh, i think everyone has seen and, and i think Terry, you being in kabul as well that you know this new uh, um, de facto regime government in place uh, does not yet have control over the entire uh, country uh, neither did the previous uh, government um so this is the situation we are facing and, and this I think gives us even more reason to believe in 
an approach where we can work at the provincial level and the local level uh, to establish uh, the services that uh, are needed, the basic services that we're speaking about right now. And then I think uh, time will tell. Uh, this is, of course, a discussion that is a political discussion that needs to take place. But I want to stress again and again that, yes, it is important for the international community. And yes, this is what we're doing, of course, in these discussions uh, to uphold the principles and of, of the UN with regard to girls' rights to school and education and so on. Um, but it is also needed, I think, to understand that also uh, people themselves, uh, the Afghans themselves, also need to uh, be supported to have that resilience and strength to continue to also argue for um, their own girls' rights also to go to school. And this is what they have been doing, and this is what they are doing, and we need to support them uh, because of that. So I think uh, the negotiating skills at the local level uh, are also really important, uh, uh, as, as, as important as the international community also talking to the uh, Taliban. Right. And Taya, what, what do we know about the Taliban priorities? You being in Kabul, do you know maybe a little bit more than us? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not quite sure. But, uh, but you know, uh, from the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, we have had meetings with, with several senior level uh, leaders. Um, the Minister of Education, the former Education Commissioner, the Minister of Health, the Minister of, of Agriculture and so on. And we actually meet open doors. Um, I, you know, they were not prepared uh, to take over. They thought that it will take another month or two before they would actually take over. So they were really unprepared on the 15th of August when they went into Kabul to kind of secure the city. I was there during the time, so I know how it felt. But um, we know that they are open towards education of... Uh, well, they have, they have opened up for grade one to grade six. In many areas where we work, girls up to grade nine are allowed to go to school. They have opened up for our uh, post-secondary school education programs, mainly education of healthcare workers. They have been flexible also when it comes to male faculty members teaching female students. Um, so there has been a flexibility that I didn't expect. Um, they are very much concerned with health uh, meeting with people in the provinces, provincial health directors, uh, they are very much concerned about it, and they are concerned about agriculture. So I think these are the three priorities they have at the moment: as education, health, and agriculture. Um, I don't think they have competent people in place, and I think this is the this is the biggest challenge that they have. They don't really have people who know how to govern. Uh, so. They are open to our advice and they are open to follow our instructions in many ways. Their demands are few. So, so I'm, I'm carefully optimistic there, but I don't think they have any agenda when it comes to economic development, uh, which is necessary to get tax revenue and so on. So, so there's a lot of things missing. And I think UN, UNDP, Ulrike, you're really, really needed in order to, to help to build business back. And in order to do that, banks must operate. So whatever the international community must do, they need to do it and unfreeze funds so that money again comes into this country. It's a huge issue, uh, much more severe than most people are aware of. So so that's just, um, I don't know if that answered your question, uh, men, but uh, I, I tried. Thank you. Karin, I see you're nodding. Yeah, I yeah. can be very brief. I would echo what Ulrika said. We must, uh, of course, listen. The UN will be, for us as Swedish CEDA, of course, in the lead on the, on the ground in the country to talk uh, directly with different partners, but also other civil society organizations that we, that we support. I don't know if they know what they were up to. I was about to say the Taliban regime. They, they were surprised by the rapidness of, of their takeover and their plans are, were seemingly not ready when they took, took, the, took over. But I want to stress again, we will not support institutionalized discrimination. Thus, we will have to find ways to work via partners that actually re works in ways that uh, 
education, health, etc., reaches everyone. Girls, boys, women, men, uh, disabled persons, etc., etc. Uh, this, uh, this would be an absolute red line for us. But right. there are partners who can do that. But there are partners. Mm. Good. That sounds yeah. good. We've been talking a little bit about, well, quite a lot about money, the need for money, finances. Uh, Ulrike, you mentioned the trust fund. The UN has just set up a trust fund uh, people, for people's economy in Afghanistan. Can you tell us a bit more about it? How, how will it work and what are the objectives? So the objectives of the trust fund is uh, to enable the support for uh, basic services, as we've mentioned, health and education, but also to support uh, livelihoods. And just take one example, uh, UNDP has developed a bidet program that is about what Terry spoke about, and that is cash for work, uh, how we can give, uh, if not loans, also uh, support to these women that have to close their micro and small businesses. Uh, you know, you spoke about the importance of the economy, of course, uh, you know, these issues are bigger. Yes, we need money into the country and, and the UN, of course, is, is, is really concerned about the situation and then looking at different ways of making sure that this can happen also to be of support also to, to INGOs that depend on, on this. Uh, but to start with, it's, it's really to uphold the local economy uh, because if that crashes, then, uh, you know, the girls will not be able to go to school and people will not be able, and people will start to, to pack their bags and, and leave. And as we've said again and again, it's time sensitive. The winter is here and it's happening in front of our area. And I think yeah, uh, we really need partners who move uh, uh, rather sooner than later. Uh, this program that we're budgeting for is 1.4 billion for uh, two years, uh, and it will enable then uh, the UN agencies uh, to coordinate their action on the ground, uh, besides what's being developed also by our colleagues uh, working uh, in, 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 in the humanitarian field. I, I believe, though, and I know that there are discussions taking place that UNICEF and others, uh, while having you know, a humanitarian leg that they can run on, should also be part of, of, of this coordinated effort. Uh, so hopefully coordination will improve along the way, and, and we will also see, uh, and we have already seen a lot of good coordination also with the INGOs present. So uh, hopefully this can be a joint effort, uh, working more strategically together, uh, and also thinking through how we can also inform the discussions also in donor capitals together as the UN together with the INGOs uh, that have a lot of trust also uh, present and and then along the way develop uh, an approach to this that is more sustainable in the long run where we can also deal uh, with the country's economy. Um, the local economy is one thing and the country economy is, is a different thing. Yeah. Right. Karin? Yes, just, uh, when we put in place uh, just uh, if, a couple of weeks after the 15th of August, these priorities and our principles on how to work. Uh, we have had all of us, uh, of course, realized that the World Bank would no longer be as important uh, or as big or maybe not even there. So we put an extra focus on the UN already in these papers on our principles and our priorities. Uh, therefore, it's good to hear that you are working and taking this forward. We are following and, and trying to push. For us, it's extremely important what I think you said last, Ulrika, and that is the, the joint approach of the UN. Um, with the one UN approach and not working in silos. There are many UN entities in the countries and you have to work with a common approach uh, on this common pro uh, challenge for the Afghan people. So we will, of course, um, um, continue support and support even uh, strong, more strongly the, the Afghan people via the UN system in, in the future, in the very near future, I hope. Right. And Taya, would you like to, to make a comment on this one? Well, no, I, I think we all, we all agree that the role of the UN is, is essential here. Uh, and then we need to look at who is actually able to to deliver on the ground. And I know that both the Swedish Committee and the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee, we are able and ready. Um, but then, of course, th there are these issues. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm coming back to this all the time. Uh, but the fact that there has to be cash in the country, uh, the fact that the banks are closed, uh, the fact that we need to look for, we are now looking for alternative mechanisms to get cash in. And it doesn't matter whether we have a 1.5 billion trust fund somewhere 
if money can't come into the country. So these are these are really essential issues that needs to be uh, dealt with. Karin, I really hope that CEDA can push from the Swedish government side uh, to make sure that these international mechanisms are, uh, are opening up so that, again, that people can just imagine people have money in their bank accounts and they are starving because they can't get it out. That's the reality. There are fights every day outside of ATMs and banks and people are desperate. Uh, crime levels are rising and because the government doesn't have much money, they are not, they don't have the money to pay the people who are armed with their Kalashnikovs. Uh, that concerns me, uh, honestly. So, um, yeah, but we, we need the UN, we need a strong UN. Um, and uh, even if the World Bank comes back, it's going to take them years to rebuild because all the people are gone. Uh, so I'm very grateful to the UN that you have stayed and that together uh, that we can stay and deliver. Right. Um, we have a few minutes left. Do we have any? Could I, Jorel, perhaps? Yes. Sorry for interrupting, no, go, go, but I just go, go, go. wanted to come here with regard to coordination. So I, I think we all agree, yes, that a coordinated action is important. Uh, I was asked actually, and once again, sorry Claire, for uh, alluding to also your Norwegian uh, uh, connection, but I was asked by the Norwegian government, you know, should, should, how much should we kind of force the coordination? I think it's good to incentivize coordination with all the players that needs to work on the ground. Yes, internally in the UN, but but... But at the same time, we also need to recognize, and I think, yeah, I mean, having Terry and Kabul, it has been an incredibly difficult time for anyone uh, in, in Afghanistan right now. So when I was asked, you know, should, should UNICEF be kind of forced uh, into the coordination mechanism of this multi trust fund? I also said, yes, I believe it's important to coordinate, but it cannot be that we have a discussion about coordination that is a technocratic discussion now when we actually need to move in the support of people. We have some overlaps. We had some overlaps with SURF funds funding or plan that were planned to fund the same clinics as we were about to, to um, support with the, the global fund money. But we adjusted and we find our way along the way. So we cannot um, hinder uh, the action uh, with the discussion on coordination now, but actually do it along the way. I think that's the approach that we need to take right now. We have yes. excellent discussion, discussions with the resident coordinator in Kabul, Ramis Alkabaro. Alakbaro is his name, I think. Uh, and we will continue that. But let's go into the detail in another meeting, Ulrika. <laughs> uh, we, we need to deliver, and we need to deliver rapidly. Uh, and we will, we will find ways of delivering also long-term development cooperation. I would like to, I have one minute, I think, before we have to <laughs> finalize and stress what, what everyone in this room knows, and that is that there are numerous crises happening on the globe uh, at the same time. I have recently um, visited Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, Myanmar is another country. DRC is a, third, is a fourth one. The Sahel, etc., etc. The need for humanitarian aid is immense, and the humanitarian principles, the humanitarian principles are very clear. Humanitarian aid should be delivered um, to people in need, to the ones most in need, wherever uh, the, the need is there. So for me, uh, it's important to work with the nexus with the approach of delivering long-term development cooperation in areas where seeming, or maybe previously, we used to mainly use humanitarian aid. This needs more other kinds of tools and other kinds of working methods, but we are good at doing it at the local level in the countries. I saw it in Sudan. We, we probably see it in, in DRC more or less every day. One sees it in Myanmar, etc. So there are methods and there are models that we can work with with the long-term development cooperation. Thank you. Let's use those models yeah. then. If anyone has a very, very quick and brief question, I see we have one person here. We have time for one question. Can you please introduce yourself as well? Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Lisa Nordström. I'm from Save the Children, Rada Barna. And I just wanted to ask, just prior to this session, we heard from Naiva Alimi saying that women must not be the collateral damage of this crisis. I think we all agree to that. At the same time, we understand that the UNDP 
Network's implementing partners have been working without women, uh, that UNDP female staff has been work to asked to work from home. So I was wondering, what is UNDP's plan for protecting female participation in humanitarian action? Also, um, how will the UNDP ensure that the trust fund you talked about earlier um, will be set up to ensure that women and girls are able to access those services and that female staff, whether frontline or office-based, are supported to safely access the workplace right. and that the UNDP and their implementing partners are held to account on both those um, issues. Right. I think, I think we would we'll... agree that without women we cannot reach women and girls. Thank you. Ulrika, briefly, please. Yes, yes. No, I, I fully agree, of course, and uh, you would be happy then to know that UNDP is actually quite good at integrating gender equality, and we will focus, I can promise you, and I'm more than happy to discuss this and make sure that you're in connection also with the colleagues on the ground who are looking in how to do this. We have female colleagues on the ground now, uh, and, and they are also encouraged uh, to be part of the development of the work, and they are also very much participating at the provincial level in the work that we are developing. So rest assured that we will have a lot of focus on this as we do. And, and we are also vetted by UN Women as one of the UN agencies being really good at integrating. It is a challenging uh, time, but we have seen actually a lot of improvement. So I don't know, you know the latest information that you had, but happy also to, to engage with you and others who are concerned and as concerned as we are with regard to the importance of integrating this into the program across the board. And the trust fund, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, has been set up because UNDP took an initiative. It's not a UNDP trust fund, it's a UN trust fund. And UNDP took the responsibility as one of the UN agencies to see to that we could have a joint trust fund and an avenue for uh, the more long-term engagement uh, besides humanitarian funding. Uh, so I think that this is also very important and Karin alluded to the discussions also taking place uh, with the RC in place. Right, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. thank you to the panel online. Thanks a lot. Very interesting discussions. And as you are in Stockholm, we would like oh. to thank you with a flower and a little yeah. gift from Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>